Okay, well, so then today we'll cover this concept of beta diversity, and this is a continuation of some of the multivariate statistics that we started uh, with the vegan package, and then we went into clustering. Um, and there's been, this has been a hot topic in the last five or six years, um, maybe even longer to longer than that, certainly the last 10 years, beta diversity has received a lot of attention and um, kind of an overview of that was provided in this paper by Pierre Legendre that was published in 2014. Um, and this is a nice primer to some of the concepts that we're going to be dealing with um, in the beta diversity in R section that we're covering today. Um, so certainly check out this paper. I'm going to um, borrow a conceptual figure from this paper on one of the next slides. Um, but the idea of this class, you know, is to introduce you to these concepts. We certainly can't cover all of the detail that's out there, but at least kind of gives you a primer on um, how to think about this idea of beta diversity. Okay. Um, so, and, and there's our script accompanying this paper in a package that we're going to explore um, that has a lot of the output from this paper. Okay. And when we say beta diversity, what we're thinking about is you, you've perhaps heard, heard of gamma diversity, all of the diversity that exists within a region. Um, and then there's alpha diversity, uh, diversity that is, occurs at a sampling site. Uh, and then there's beta diversity, the difference in diversity between samples. And beta diversity is typically calculated through space, but it can also be calculated through time, essentially thinking about two communities and how they differ from each other. Okay, that's what we mean when we use the term beta diversity. Um, and, this can, and, and so um, we can think about differences or dissimilarities. We've talked about this concept of dissimilarity being one minus similarity. So those, those things are related to each other. That comes into play when we're thinking about beta diversity. But we know that these dissimilarities among communities can arise from two different processes. And these are kind of the core of uh, this this idea of beta diversity. So the first is this idea of species replacement, or sometimes referred to as turnover. And this is related to the fact that we know that species tend to replace each other along ecological gradients. So in my world, in the fish world, we think about starting in a headwater stream and going all the way down to a large river. There's fish that occur up in the headwaters that don't occur in the main stem. They're replaced by other species. So this idea of we, uh, some species don't occur at some point over the gradient, and then others begin to occur. We call that species replacement or turnover. Um, and then the second is this idea of richness difference, sometimes referred to as nestedness. One community might be a nested subset of another community, um, meaning that there, there's five species present at one location, and three of those same five might be present at another location. That would be a nested pattern. Of course, there's differences beyond just strictly nested. There can be um, some species that occur at, at the other site that, um, that aren't at the other site, but it's still a smaller number of species. So that's where this broader idea of richness differences comes in. Okay, So one community might have more species present than another. Um, and so in, in that uh, paper by Legendre from 2014, if you read about that, he'll give you the background. There's an appendix to that paper that goes into a lot of detail for those that are interested in beta diversity of historically where these ideas came from and the different phases um, through, through time that we've uh, gone through in our thinking about this concept of beta diversity, okay? But keep in mind, it's basically um, uh, the joint effects of species replacement and richness differences that are operating here. And so here's a conceptual diagram. This is straight out of that Legendre paper um, that's showing two sites, so sampling location. Here we have site one, and here we have site two. And each of these boxes represents species. So there's 16 species total if you count between those two sites. So our gamma diversity would be 16 species here. Across all of the sites, which are only two here, um, we have 16 species. And then at site one, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 species. Our alpha diversity there might be those 13 species. And then at site two, there's the same five that occurred at site one, 
but then there's these other three that didn't occur there in site one that is and so uh, we could refer to that as uh, those eight species are the alpha diversity at site two but then when we compare the two sites that's when we're move, moving into the realm of beta diversity okay and notice along the top here components of beta diversity uh, based on jacquards and this is a similarity or dissimilarity metric that's very commonly used with presence absence data and then Sorensen is the other one and we're going to explore jacquard and Sorensen a little bit today okay but the components of these are the same there's a which are the species that are shared between the two locations um, there's b the species that occur at one that are unique in this case to site one and then there's C, the species that are unique to site two, okay? So there's the A, B, and C across the top. And that's what we're using over here when we start to think about um, similarity or overlap. Th this A component, these five species that occur at both locations, that contributes to some level of similarity. These, these two sites are not totally different in their species composition. There's these five species that occur at each. We call that component A. Then there's the component that um, the, the components that um, contribute to dissimilarity. So those that are unique to um, site one, the B component, and then those that are unique to site um, two, the C component. So B plus C gives us the dissimilarity component. Okay, and that's typically what we're thinking about in beta diversity. How dissimilar are two locations based in this case on species occurrence? Okay, um, a, a fraction of B and C is this idea of replacement. So notice that um, these three species in the blue open boxes occur at site one, and they are replaced by three different species at site two. And so we call that replacement. Um, and then we can think about um, B minus C, this red area as differences in richness. Okay, so these five species occur at site one, but not at site two, okay? There is a lot going on here. I recognize if you haven't thought about beta diversity before, um, that um, th this is a lot to take in at, at one time, okay? So, so we'll spend a little bit of time thinking more about this, but the main take home messages here, A, number of species present at both sites, B, number of species present at site one, but not site two, and then see the uh, number of species present at site two, but not site one, okay? Um, and of course, th this is a figure, as Legendre points out, that's taken from previous thoughts about how we think about um, um, beta diversity, okay? Um, so, as I said, Jacquard and Sorensen are the two metrics that we're using here. In previous lectures, when we were doing non-metric multidimensional scaling, for example, we talked about Bray-Curtis dissimilarity, the Bray-Curtis distance, which is an abundance-based measure of um, dissimilarity. Here, we're focusing on Jacquard and Sorensen, which are presence-absence-based or occurrence-based, okay? Uh, and so Jacquard, calculates the unique species as a proportion of the total number of species uh, recorded between the two communities, okay? And, these, and so these dissimilarities or distances are always measured as pairwise comparisons between um, individual sampling locations or communities, okay? So Jacquard thinks about um, the proportion of unique species as a, as a um, function of the total number of species that are there. And Sorensen does the same thing but it double weights the shared species, okay? So in the equations that I'm gonna show you in a moment, you might notice that there's a two added into the Sorensen that doesn't occur in the Jacquard. And that's because George, uh, the Sorensen is just double weighting the shared species, okay? It's just a, a slightly different way of thinking about dissimilarity um, where we give a little bit more emphasis to the shared species. And what that means then is that the Sorensen values are always lower than Jacquard, okay? They're very similar to each other. They give you a lot of the same information, but Sorensen, because of this double weighting of the shared species, always has beta diversity values that is slightly lower than Jacquard, okay? And when you're reading the literature, you might see um, typically that both of these are used and they give pretty consistent um, results. And you may have, based on your own field of study, 
some reason for selecting one over the other. Um, but for today, we'll we'll incorporate both of them um, just so you can kind of see the, the the differences between the two. Okay. Um, and so, of course, the benefit of using R uh, in the in the um, package and functions related to beta, beta diversity is it does a lot of the calculations for you. And so we won't spend a lot of time on these um, equations. Um, but certainly those of you that are interested in, in incorporating beta diversity into your research, you'll want to spend time understanding these and getting a hold of what is actually being calculated when we think about Jacquard versus Sorensen. And then what Legendre refers to as the, the uh, Padani families and the Baselga family. So these are two authors that have spent a lot of time thinking about beta diversity and have published multiple works in both cases on um, their interpretation of beta diversity and how it should be implemented, okay? Um, so the kind of prevailing theme from Legendre is that the uh, Padani family is more appropriate, although there's, there's arguments for and against both of these, okay? And that paper from 2014, gives a lot of detail about the arguments for and, and against the use of each of these, okay? I just want you to be aware that these are both implemented in the, um, in the um, ADE, full, ADE spatial package that we'll be using for beta diversity. Um, and some of you may in your own research have a reason for selecting one over the other. Um, but, but notice we're doing things like two times the minimum of um, B and C, remember those are the um, number of species that are unique to either the first community or the second community. A is the shared species. And so when we look at um, this, and this is a way of estimating replacement or turnover, and then richness, which is this idea of nestedness or differences in, in, in richness between two locations. And so, um, the Jacquard is here for the Padani family. And then here is Sorensen. And notice the main difference is just two times A in the denominator here. We're giving a higher weighting to the shared species between the two communities, okay? It becomes a little bit more complex when you start to move into um, the, um, the Selga family of beta diversities, but the concept doesn't really change. We're just thinking about these two ideas of replacement, or, or turnover um, versus differences in richness or sometimes called nestedness, okay? And the NES reflects this use of nestedness in the um, Baselga family, okay? Um, but, but notice there's a lot of similarity between the two. They, they'll give you somewhat consistent answers and there's some, and, we'll, and I'm gonna show you a, another paper that has more recently done simulations comparing these and, and they do measure slightly different things, okay? But there's like a bird's eye view of, of everything that's going on between Jacquard and Sorensen and the Adani and the um, Baselga ways of thinking about beta diversity. Um, so this is the paper that I was telling you. This was just um, published in Ecological Indicators in 2020. Um, Chimera is the first author, but uh, Legendre is a co-author on this. And in this paper, they use fish data. This isn't my own bias. This is just the current realm of um, beta diversity science. Fish tend to be incorporated into a lot of the examples. Um, and what they're showing you here in the upper right is a matrix of sites one through five. And then these columns represent the occur um, different uh, species, okay? So, and then one means the species was present and a dot here just for quick interpretation means um, absence, okay? So this first species present at site one and two, absent from site three, four, and five. The second species, the second column here, this species present at site one, absent from site two and three, present at site four, absent from site five, and so on, okay? So we have this really interesting matrix of this small number of species and a small number of sites, but we can start to think about um, these pairwise con um, contributions to beta diversity, okay? Uh, and we, think, we can think about overlap, richness difference, and replacement, the A, B, and uh, well, the A, the overlap or the similarity, and then those things that contribute to beta diversity, okay, which would be richness difference um, and, re and um, replacement or turnover, okay? 
And, and so this is just this is just walking through all pairwise comparisons, site one and two, for example, so site one and site two. We have some overlap. This first species occurs in both, but then there's a large richness difference because there's four species present at site one, but only one present at site two. So we have some overlap, we have richness difference, but we don't have any replacement. But if we consider site one versus site three, we do have replacement. We actually don't have any overlap because here these first three species and the final species occur, others are absent, but at site three, the fifth species and the sixth species occur, but none other. So we have complete turnover or replacement. And along with that, richness differences, because there's two species here and there's four species here, okay? Um, so this is a data set that we, just given the nature of the data, gives you an idea of the um, different ways of thinking about these pairwise comparisons and, contribute, or, and uh, their contributions to beta diversity, okay? We won't go through all of those in exhaustion, but I just wanted to give you another example of, of how to think about beta diversity. And in this paper that we just published last year, um, through some simulations and then use on this Death Valley fish data from the 70s, um, they recommend the use of the Padani equations um, over the Baselga family. Um, okay, so you can read that paper if you want more detail about how to make decisions on which of the families, as Legendre calls them, of beta diversity you might be interested in. Okay, for the purposes of today, though, just an illustration of, of how beta diversity manifests and how it might play out across different sites um, given species occurrence. Okay, and then the last thing that we'll talk about, this was another paper by Legendre in Ecology Letters published in 2013, where we can think about from a species composition matrix and um, where we have sites by species, we've been thinking about these types of matrices ever since we started the community uh, ecology. Um, section of this of this class. You can use species transformations to get a Euclidean um, distance. And so you end up with this dissimilarity among distance um, or, or dissimilarity among sampling units. You can either do it through some other function or through a transformation to create a Euclidean distance. Each of these numbers in parentheses represents an equation that's presented in this ecology letters paper. And the main point that I wanted to, to get at with this is that we have, um, we have total beta diversity, but we can think about local or site-specific contributions to beta diversity, this local contribution beta diversity, LCBD. And we can think about species contribution to beta diversity, SCBD. And so what this allows us to do is take this whole beta diversity as it exists across all of the sites, decompose it into um, species differences or richness differences um, in turnover or replacement. But we can also think about specific locations or specific species and how those contribute to beta diversity as it plays out across a, a sampling area, okay? So this may be of interest to some of you. I wanted to introduce the concept and then I'll show you how to implement this in R, okay? But we can think about location-specific contributions to beta diversity and species specific contributions to beta diversity. And what this might look like, here's another example. This was just published in Conservation Biology in 2017. Um, this is showing sampling sites within a stream network. So the dots, dotted line in the background. This might be when a stream starts to dry down. This might be when the stream has completely gone through a dry phase. And then when it re-wets and water returns, notice the blue line is solid here. And this is just showing a very simple three sampling locations. That's what the larger dotted um, circles represent. And then within each of those locations, species that are, re are represented as occurring based on different shapes, okay? Uh, and then it's showing it across time. So gamma diversity, remember that's the number of species that occur across the entire region. Um, then we have alpha diversity at each of these locations. And then the pairwise differences between those is our beta diversity. And then we can decompose that into percent replacement or turnover or um, differences in richness or sometimes called nestedness, okay? Um, and we can think about how that might change in these scenarios across drying and an intermittent stream. 
But what I want you to notice then, if we just we just take one of these examples, um, we can calculate from this location, the location specific contribution to beta diversity in terms of replacement and the location con um, contribution to, or local um, contribution to beta diversity in terms of richness differences, okay? And notice that um, we have the highest alpha diversity here, the largest number of species at this site, uh, and then as we move down, these other sites are just nested subsets of that, okay? So we have the, uh, in this case, the um, square, the circle, the plus, those occur here. We have the triangle, the diamond, the plus, triangle, diamond, plus, those occur here, okay? So this is the concept of nested subsets. And notice that there's a large contribution of this location to richness differences because there's a lot of species that occur there. Um, and, and then as we go into these where, um, where there's um, nested subsets, the location, the local contribution to beta diversity and richness is much, it's a smaller value, okay? And these values will be between zero and one. Um, and so they're, they're proportioned, okay? But notice between this site and this site, we have turnover. The only species that occurs in both of those is this plus or um, cross here. Then we have the circle and the square here and the diamond and the triangle here. So the local contribution or, or the location contribution to diversity for replacement or turnover is pretty high because from here to here, two species are replaced by two new species, okay? And then of course, how this plays out over time is another way of thinking about these beta diversity patterns, okay? So um, we, we can think about differences in community composition through space, um, how does that, um, how can we break that down into replacement differences or richness differences or replacement and then individual locations, okay? So there's a lot going on here. It's a very powerful set of analyses for examining differences in species um, occurrence. And the last thing I'll show you is just one more example, again, from streams. This is getting a lot of attention. Sometimes it's aquatic invertebrates, um, sometimes it's fishes, but this is just an example within a stream network of a paper that was just published in the journal Hydrobiologia last year, where it's sampling sites shown as circles, and then the stream network shown in a line. Uh, here on the right side, it's showing species richness from a dark purple being low richness to a, a red color being high richness. Um, and then local or um, yeah, local contribution to beta diversity, where um, high contributions are shown as red and low contributions are shown as purple. And so we can start to think about, well, where is most of the diversity? Where is most of the richness from an alpha um, diversity perspective? And then how is, is the differences in beta diversity playing out across space shown here as the local contribution to beta diversity, okay? So these are the types of spatial analyses that you can do if you're interested in community composition and, and the differences in, in the, um, Low in, in um, occurrence of species among those locations. Okay, um, and and of course that's just a, just scraping the top of the beta beta diversity literature that exists out there. But I thought that, you know these are the papers that if I was just taking a new pass at this, this is where I would start. And so certainly that's just for those in the class that are interested in beta diversity, read the paper by Legendre 2014 for sure. But then some of this more recent stuff. Um, might be helpful for getting an idea of how this might be applied um, to ecological settings um, in the systems that you may be working in. Uh, and then that brings us to the R package that we're going to focus on for today. Okay, so this um, package ADE spatial, we're firmly still within multivariate st um, statistics, but now we're doing multi scale spatial analyses. Okay, first um, from the perspective of beta diversity. Okay, so we'll load this package today and we'll go through some of the functions that are related to beta diversity. Certainly there's much more beyond that when we start to think about things like um, asymmetric eigenvector mapping, Moran's eigenvector maps or the NEMs. Um, there's a lot going on in this package. And what that means is when we load it, there's gonna be a lot of dependency packages um, when, when we first install it, okay? Um, so there's a kind of overview of beta diversity. Let me just check the chat to make sure um, we're doing okay. Chat window, uh, there's nothing there. Everyone, everyone doing okay. The, the next thing we'll do 
Let's just jump over to R and I'll show you how to implement some of this stuff, okay? And this is an R script that I shared with my class on Canvas. Um, but uh, for those that may be watching this later, um, where you don't have access to Canvas, we'll just go through in installing everything. So you'll have access to the data and you can run through these examples yourself, okay? Um, but the first thing that we wanna do is install this package ADE Spatial, okay? So R Studio notices, hey, there's a, there's a call to um, the library to search for a package that hasn't been installed. So we can install it. And remember from our earlier experiences, installing a package before you've loaded other packages is the best practice, okay? And you may also wanna just check on your packages to make sure um, that they're all updated before we try to install a new one. So I'm just gonna check for updates. We just did this two weeks ago, but as you can see, there's a lot of updates that are happening, um, especially since we've moved over to the newest version of R, there's a suite of updates going through. So I'm gonna select all uh, and run through these um, updates. And if you're following along, I would recommend that you run through the updates before we install this new AD spatial. It's going to take a minute to run through those, but it's good practice to, to keep the packages updated. If you read the paper uh, by Legendre from 2014, there is an example in there of using data from the Do River um, data set, which we have actually already talked about in previous lectures in this course. And on YouTube, I put together a playlist that shows the lectures in the order that they um, should be viewed in terms of those that might be coming into this new. Um, so we've talked about this Do River data set before. Um, and we're gonna to return to that today for the examples um, that we use in this class. But my point is that if you read that paper by Legendre, um, the same data set is used to illustrate some of these um, beta diversity concepts in that paper, okay? So I know I'm a fish head, but I recognize everyone that's in this class and viewing this, you're not into fish. It's just a coincidence that the beta diversity folks also happen to use a lot of um, a lot of fish examples, okay? So I'm not trying to overly push my study organism to those that, that don't study fish. Okay, so, it, you know, sometimes this might appear that it's finished, but remember if the stop sign is up there, um, that it's still working on going through um, updates, okay? Uh, and there, it looks like it just finished going through all that. You kind of saw the packages blink for a second there. Um, notice the stop sign is now gone um, and it gives um, that the downloaded source packages are in my library. Okay, and on this computer, that's where the library is loaded, uh, located. So let's try and go through this install um, for ADE Spatial. Um, it's a very powerful program for the, or a package for those that are interested in spatial ecology. And I know from earlier in the semester when we did our um, survey of what you're interested in doing. Spatial ecology is, is a theme um, for students in the class. And so we'll spend a bit more time learning about ADD spatial next week when we move into spatial ecology, okay? So this time invested in updating all of packages and, uh, and then loading this very complex package um, is well spent if you're interested in um, spatial ecology. And, and for those reading the recent literature, you're going to see this package um, cited quite a bit. Okay. So just going through the install here, and it worked. Okay, downloaded packages um, are in the in my local library. Okay, so I recognize some of you. Your machine is probably still working on that. Most of your machines are faster than this one that I'm teaching from. But you know, go through that process. If there's someone that gets hung up. Um, we can we can wait for you, or we can just go through the um, little bit of code that's here to to run this. Okay, is there anyone that feels strongly either way? Should be able to, after that install to run library ad spatial. Yep, and then registered S three methods overwritten by ad graphics. So there's other 
functions that ADE4 uses that are overwritten. And that's just giving us a warning of that. It's not necessarily a, um, a failure um, because those are, are, are two related packages. You might expect that there's some overlap in terms of the functions that are defined for each of those. We are also going to load the ADE4 package though because um, it comes with the Do River data set. So I'm just going to load that one. Um, and then you should be able to, once, um, once those two libraries are loaded, to just run data on the do and notice that it's a list of four. Remember, there's some environmental data, there's some spatial data, there's some species data. Um, so there's more than just the fish data present there. But we're really just interested in the fish. So we're going to do the same thing we've been doing throughout the semester. We're going to create an object. We're going to call it fish. Uh, we're, we're going to say this uh, to to write as so everything to the right of the arrow will be written as the object fish. We're going to go into this data set from the do. We're going to do a dollar sign and we're just going to grab fish, the one the column fish out of there. Okay. If we run that, we get an object called fish. Thirty observations of twenty-seven variables. And if we click on that, notice across the top these are different taxa. And then each of these 30 observations are sites from the headwaters down to the mouth of this river um, where these species were collected. Okay. Um, there's one little oddity in this data set that we talked about when we first introduced it, and that said sampling location eight, no species were collected, no fish were collected. So what we do is we're going to create an object called fish, which is redundant with what we just did on nine. So what that means is it's going to replace what was previously called fish with this new thing called fish. This is a concept called overwriting, overwriting. Uh, and so, and we're going to overwrite it by just taking fish, indexing it, and removing the eighth row. Okay, remember before the comma are rows, after the comma columns, we put a negative in front of the eight. It's going to remove the eighth observation. And so when you run this line of code, what I want you to notice is that fish will still uh, um, appear here, but this 30 observations should be reduced to 29 observations, okay? So if we run that, now we have 29 observations. We're just excluding that location that had no observations of fish, okay? Um, now, because we have loaded the library ADE spatial, we're ready to actually calculate beta diversity components, in this case for Jacquard. So to do this, we're going to create an object called fish.beta-diversity-bd.j for Jacquard. We're going to use the function beta.dive.components, or C-O-M-P. We're going to um, use the data fish that we just created. We're telling it we wanted to use the coefficient equals to capital J. And we'll, we'll take a deeper dive in a second here to, to think about other coefficients. But this is the, um, the Padani. Um, family in, in using the Jacquard um, um, fam or the, the Jacquard dissimilarity index. Okay, and then we want to pull quanti uh, the quantitative data from that. Okay, so quant equals true. Of course, if you could do question mark beta dot div dot comp um, in the internal help, let's just do that real fast. We'll do question mark um, beta dot div dot comp. When we do that. The internal help tab opens up here and it tells us that we're using a function from the ADE spatial package. It gives you a description. So it's the two families of decompositions of Jacquard and Sorensen dissimilarity coefficients and their quantitative forms. Okay. Um, and then it's going to divide it into what they refer to as um, replacement and richness differences. Okay. Um, and this is for species presence, absence, or abundance data, okay? And all of this is described in that Legendre 2014 paper that I showed you at the beginning of the, um, of the lecture, okay? Uh, so then the main thing that we want to change or, or think about changing if, if, if you want to run this is this um, coefficient equals to J. So J, Jacquard from the Padani family, S is from the uh, Sorensen from that same family. Um, BS is the Baselga family Sorensen based indices. And then BJ is from the Baselga family um, um, Jacquard. Okay. And then there's an N family actually from that 2011 paper that I showed you um, 
in the in the previous lecture. Um, this is a, the re revitalized nestedness index. So they they kind of think of that as a unique case of the um, um, richness differences, where you might have strictly nested subsets. Okay. For most of you that are starting to think about beta diversity, I would start with the capital S or the capital J, okay? And then as you get into the more nuances or nuanced um, criteria within beta diversity, you can start to, to take a deeper dive into some of these others, okay? And if we go back up, notice um, under usage, remember that it gives you the default or what would be used in the absence of specifying an argument. And notice that the jacquard from the Adani family um, or capital J is the default. And so that's just what we'll run for today. Okay. So hopefully everyone uh, understands this line of code and then how you might change that line of code if you wanted to fit some other um, beta diversity components. So I'm going to run that. It creates a list of five elements, fish.bd.j. Uh, and what we can do then is we can just um, type in the name of that object, the dollar sign. We could grab all of the pairwise replacement richness, um, beta diversity, um, but what we're interested in is just partitioning, P-A-R-T, into these components of richness di differences um, or um, replacement, okay? So, so if I run that, what we get down here, um, and if I just pull this across, it'll, it'll, um, Sorry, I meant to move the, I realize you guys can't see this, but there's a little window from Zoom on here that I have to get out of the way. There we go. Okay, so we have beta diversity total. That's the total beta diversity within all of these sites. Here's the portion of that that's related to replacement. Here's the portion of that that's related to richness differences. And then here's just the portion that's uh, related to replacement divided by total so that we get a proportion of um, replacement and then the same thing for richness difference so this value and this value will sum to one to the total beta diversity that exists there let's partition that into replacement sometimes called turnover or, and, and then richness differences sometimes called nesting okay and the in the dominant form here um because 62 percent or or the proportion 0.62 is related to richness differences in the Dew River fish data. Okay, so we could conclude that based on the Jacquard dissimilarity matrix from the Padani family of beta um, diversity, that um, most of the differences in communities within the Dew River data is are related to differences in richness. Okay, we can do the same thing down here for Sorensen. Notice the only thing that I've changed on line 17 compared to line 13 is the coefficient. I just changed that to a capital S. And remember, Sorensen compared to Jacquard, Sorensen is just giving a double weighting to the shared species um, between the two communities. And so we should see similar patterns, but the values would just be the um, absolute values. So the BD total, the replacement and the richness differences, those values would be slightly smaller if we compare Sorensen to Jacquard. So we can run this, then we can grab the partition then we can just look at the difference between those two, okay? So total beta diversity when we use Jacquard, 0 0.377. When we use Sorensen, 0 0.323. Slightly smaller, but within the neighborhood, right? Replacement difference before was 0 0.14. Now it's 0 0.12. Richness difference before, 0 0.23. Now 0 0.203. So um, just the double weighting of the shared species means that there's a little bit less beta diversity there because we're weighting, we're more heavily weighting the shared species. They contribute to similarity, okay? But then if we consider the fractions, notice that when we take um, for, for the Sorensen replacement divided by total beta diversity, we get values that are very close to what we would have concluded um, using the um, Descartes um, dissimilarity, okay? So there's uh, just the basics of how to um, decompose these um, um, components of beta diversity um, for the whole data set using Jacquard, Sorensen. You could explore using the Baselga families as well, okay? Um, the next thing that I wanted to just give you an introduction to was this idea of um, local comp 
distribution to beta diversity. So these measures of beta diversity that we just considered are across all of the samples and all of the pairwise comparisons. But we can take a deeper dive and think about individual locations and how those might contribute to replacement or richness differences. And of course, if you find a location that has a really strong contribution, um, those, that, those might be locations or the location where we would want to emphasize uh, conservation or preservation. This is a way of just thinking about um, spatial ecology from the perspective of beta diversity. And the function that we're using here, so we're going to create an object that's called local dot replacement. We're going to do LCBD all capital dot C O M P. That's the function. And here we're going to grab from the thing that we created earlier, fish dot beta diversity dot uh, jacquard. We're going to grab. We're going to um, we're going to use that data and specifically the replacement portion of it. And then we're going to do this, um, the square root uh, equals true. This is explained in the details, but this is what they advocate for doing if you're interested in, in, in calculating the local contribution of beta diversity. Okay. So I'm going to run that. And then if we have a look at that, that's what the next line of code is going to do. We now have um, beta diversity, total beta diversity across all of the locations, but then Here's the contributions of individual locations. So remember there were 30 locations, but we removed one of those, we removed eight. And so there's, here's one through six, and then this seven in brackets means this is the seventh, then this is the eighth and so on, and then this is the 13th, 14th and so on, and then this is the 19th, right? 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. So each location in the order that we um, loaded them, this is their contribution to, um, in this case, local contribution of beta diversity in terms of um, replacement for the jacquard beta uh, dissimilarity matrix. Okay. And we can do the same thing for um, richness difference. Okay. And then we can have a look at that. So some of these contributions are higher for um, for one um, measure of uh, in in this case. So replacement, this location number twelve, the twelfth sampling site, has a large contribution um, to replacement, but a low contribution to richness. Okay, so so we're just interpreting the magnitudes of these as a a proportion of the of the overall contribution. Okay, so if you you were to add all of these together, you should get a value of 0.23, okay? So that's uh, how we can decom uh, decompose um, the um, location specific or, or location contribution. The last thing that I wanted to show you then was how to look at species contribution to beta diversity. Um, and so here we're using a different function. This is beta.div. We're, uh, we're running it on fish and then we're keeping the abundance data and we're transforming those original abundance data using the Hellinger transformation that we talked about early on. Um, and so what this will give us if we run that is then some measures of here's the total beta diversity, here's species contribution to beta diversity. Notice some species um, like this species have a, a relatively large contribution to beta diversity across all of those sites compared to other species. We can also calculate the location contribution to beta diversity. And interestingly, this um, allows you to give um, a significance test. Does the contribution of each location contribute significantly to the beta diversity? Um, and this is the, the p-value for that. And then there's the adjusted p-value. Remember um, this concept of, um, of um, type one error where if you have lots of tests, you'll, you're, there's more likely that you will, you'll find a significant difference. And so we can, it actually does an adjustment to the p-value for you there, okay? To determine in this case which locations have um, the greatest contribution to to beta diversity. Okay, but it also gives you if you're interested, and some of you may be, in species contribution to beta diversity. So within the landscape, or in this case riverscape, 
which species are contributing most to the beta diversity that we see as it plays out across space. Okay. So um, that we've covered a lot. I recognize that, but we're and we're just really kind of scratching the surface of beta diversity. It's a complex um, area of research and an expanding area of research. Uh, and so, you know, in, in the spirit of recognizing that not that not everyone in this class is into beta diversity, I just asked you in the coding challenge if you use the Dune data and the Mite data from the vegan package, which we have already looked at in some of our um, clustering and multivariate stats. Are those primarily structured by richness differences um, or species replacement? Okay, um, so this idea of um, sometimes called nesting, sometimes called turnover, but I would I would get in the habit of using richness difference or species replacement um, if you're gonna if you're gonna spend much time in the beta diversity realm. Um, so to do that coding assignment, you would just load the vegan package, load the mite data, load the dune data, and then just go through. Um, some of this early um, beta um, death dive dot com. Okay. Um, so I'll uh, I'll stop the recording there, and I'll just give you time to work through that um, on your own. And I'll I'll hang out here and, and kind of help people as you're working through that. Okay. And of course, if there's any questions about any of this stuff, we can spend some time talking about it.